Morgan. Morgan. Is Harvey on sabbatical? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Why? Could just because that was, I, I thought he had said sabbatical at one point when I was there, and then he hasn't answered me back. And he's been a bit distracted recently. I, so, okay. Just keep on him. He's, okay. um, he actually just just emailed me. He's had a couple of information sec uh, sessions for his trip to Ecuador. He's doing okay. Oh, he's, he's going to Ecuador. Yeah, now he's running plant systematics in Ecuador instead of Panama. We have a, we have a um, collaboration with the uh, University of Quito, mm -hmm. and they have, a, they have a field station and all this stuff, and they're very keen on having him come down with, with our classes and stuff, so they're helping him do all the logistics. Oh, that's, per that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. So we're going we're going to uh, Panama mm -hmm. at at the end of the well just after the end of the semester and then two students. So are you going to Boca del Toro? Yeah, yeah, same. And they they told me they could take us over to the mainland uh, so we can see a couple of other sites on the mainland too. Oh, okay. So, so it should. But you're staying at that smaller field yeah. station. Yeah. yeah. And not, have, not the Smithsonian Field Station. Yeah, not the Smithsonian Field, field Station. Although they, um, after I set it all up, uh, uh, Larry Skog at the Smithsonian asked why I didn't set it up with the Smithsonian. They will do uh, tours for you, and that you, the one time that I went to Panama with Harvey, he did a tour of it, and it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Street, is it, I think? Yeah. No, so keep after him. He's, he's got 62 and a half things going on as usual. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's easy for me. We share a wall. <laughs> oh, but he is going to be gone. Yeah, he's going to be gone next weekend. They're going to a Eating. I think they might be going to like the Southeast biology oh. meeting or something. Okay. Down, there, down in like, I say North Carolina. Yeah, I forget where it was, but it, I, it's, I think it was in one of the Carolinas. Yeah. It used to be about the time for it. Yeah. Yeah, he's taking, he's taking Jen and Dina as two master's students are going. And so, did Harlan, did Harlan defend? He's defending this summer. This summer, He's okay. actually in my office yesterday, and he's like, yeah, I'm defending this summer. And I'm like, I'm on your committee, aren't I? How come I don't know this? <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to affect my summer vacation? <laughs> but yes, he's, he's, on, he's on target to finish this summer. Okay. Yeah, I knew he was, I knew he had to be close. Good to know. Yeah, whenever, on Twitter, whenever I see Passiflora, good Passiflora photos, I tag him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like Twitter now. I wasn't using it much until you were telling me about it, but there's so many scientists on there. There really is. A, a nice flow of papers all of the time to look at or interesting things in your life. Yeah, I have found that I like, yeah. Some people, I was missing some people, like in my feed, because you can't keep up with a feed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it's the same way on Facebook and stuff like this. So there are a couple of key people that I actually have like an alert, and it alerts me when they when they tweet so that I don't miss good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I do that for, for, for a few people. Because it's a small class. I keep hoping it'll help keep like you and other alums of ours engaged too with the department. I try to treat some stuff the department. Yeah. The student stuff. enhancement grants just came out. Oh, the, yeah. The SEAs. The SEAs do. 
uh, did someone in the department get one? Two people did. Anne, you know Anne from Harvey's Lab? Yeah. Anne got one, and uh, uh, a new faculty member, uh, student, uh, got one too. Okay. Yeah, and I've, I've been working a little bit with Rachel. Uh, we we have this we have a sequencer on campus and it can run but I can still sequence for about half the price through the genomics facility ah, okay. so I've been, been talking to Rachel been, been back and forth yeah a little bit yeah Rachel tried to poach one of my undergraduates she's like oh are you gonna be here next year would you like a a, a job in the genomics facility and kind of like uh, Rachel Mine? <laughs> mine, 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 mine. Yeah. No, Lexi was graduating, so it was okay. But I was like, Amanda, don't you go up to this sequencing facility. They'll try and get you, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> so so you, are you still doing quite a bit of algae, al algae systematics, or are you mostly uh, ecology? Yeah. No, I'm doing, I'm, I'm actually going to, I've been starting, I'm going to write a book on the freshwater red algae of the world. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's going to bring together all of the systematics work. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're done with the Tree of Life work for the most part? The Tree of Life grant finished. Yeah, I, I knew it should have anyway. Yeah, so the Tree of Life finished and then I, I got like a old person grant, <laughs> called it Opus, where you're supposed to take all of the work that you did mm -hmm. over your career and put it into a book so that the next generation has an easy access to where to next. Yeah. I did, I'm going to be in the next generation too. But. Mm -hmm. I'm still way too obsessive. You're a systematist. <laughs> yeah. It's a lab. Scientific community is an international community as well. 
uh, we thought it would be uh, useful and helpful to include their voices in today's presentation. So we have Dr. Monica Herrero, who is a biologist uh, and actually uh, works in the same field as Dr. Hunter in, in teacher education. And we have Dr. Maria Angeles Fernandez, who is a geologist. And they together, uh, we shared with them the, the questions ahead of time. Um, so they collaboratively tackled some of those questions. And it's about a 13 minute video um, that they put together for you. Uh, and we're very, they just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. And they're very excited to be able to participate. So with that, we can go ahead and... Uh, so, hello, good morning from the University of Oviedo, Spain. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank Dr. Megan Gibbons for her kind invitation to take part in this interesting panel. Uh, from here, from the University of Oviedo, we would like to send our best wishes to the staff and to the students of the Glenville College uh, for the success of this interesting activity. So, first of all, we would like to introduce ourselves Firstly, my colleague Rafael. Hi, Hi, I'm Ángeles Fernández. I work as an assistant professor at the Department of Crystallography and Meteorology at the University of Oviedo. I'm very happy to answer your questions. And my name is Monica Herrero. I'm a lecturer at this university in the Department of Educational Sciences and in the area of experimental sciences didactics. I'm a biologist and I've been working as a scientist scientific researcher for, let's say, more than 25 years. So, well, regarding your first question, what led me go into the STEM field? Uh, uh, I would say that I, I, I was interested in biology since I was really very young. I must be, let's say, six, seven years old. And the first time I heard my older sister, six years older, talking about cells, because uh, she was studying and uh, reading her book. And I heard for, for, for the first time in my life about cells as the smallest and um, basic uh, structural and functional units um, in, in living organisms. And I was really impressed for that, because in my childish mind, I was thinking about a very tiny, tiny insect or something like that, and when I saw for the first time the models representing the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, I was completely amazed, surprised, so I, full, I was full of curiosity and I excited that I wanted to learn more to understand everything about that wonderful uh, world of cells. And later on, uh, my field of, expert, of expertise uh, was developed in the area of uh, microbial biotechnology. So in my case, it's easier. I always like it more. Thanks for that wonderful plan we have. And I wanted to know how it works. Is it the discrimination? Definitely, yes. In Spain, like in many other developed countries, legislation absolutely prohibits sex discrimination. Moreover, there are some positive discrimination measures to favor the incorporation of women into the fields of science and technology. But in reality, there is a long way to go. In science, one of the main, main problems of women is the so-called glass ceiling, that there are the difficulties to progress in the professional career. I'm going to show you some plots. This pyramid represents the world of the Spanish university in terms of the differences between women and men. As you can see, about a half of our students are women. Moreover, their records are better than the men's ones. However, the, percent, the percentage of women professors is lower, and even is lower in the case of full professors. And there is absolutely 
a small number of women that are rectors. In this plot, the x-axis represents the scientific career from the beginners to the leaders of the groups, from beginners, junior uh, researchers, and senior researchers to leaders. The green line represents the evolution of men, and uh, the purple line, the evolution of women. As you can see, in the beginning of the scientific career, women are the majority because the records in the careers are higher and they can get better grants. But when we go to professors, um, to juniors and senior uh, researchers, men are the majority. And at the end, leaders of groups are in a majority men. I think that the way we can change that, and in fact, many important things in the world, is that many people concentrate in doing it well. I mean, if I find myself in a situation of discrimination, I will make sure that it is known. And I will propose myself not to do the same in any situation. Uh, moreover, it's important to participate in initiatives like the Women's Day on Science and to have the sensitivity of uh, explaining to girls that science is a good uh, place for her and to support that people with responsibilities that are sensitive with the women's problems in science. Is it getting better? Definitely it is. 100 years ago, there was practically no women at the University in Science in Spain. And the first time we had a full professor in the Spanish University was here at the University of Oviedo, and it was only 50 years ago. The changes in the society are going in the same direction and at the same time. But the last career we have to overcome are more difficult because they are less tangible. Well, and regarding your question about what um, challenges uh, did I face as a woman in, into the STEM field, uh, I would say that I, I didn't have any of them, uh, any, any difficulty as a woman in science uh, during my period as a student or as a doctoral student as well. Um, I mean, my the main challenge for me uh, was maternity and uh, I've been working in different uh, research groups and my personal experience, and I'm saying it's, it's my personal experience, uh, was that uh, of course it's very, it's not easy to, to balance your personal life and your working life. But my impression is that my, once you, you, you reach uh, maternity, there's like a subliminal um, opinion about how um, could you be able um, to um, keep um, your strong commitment with our research project. So it's it was like a um, like a, like lack of confidence, and probably uh, the, my impression is that maybe maternity is not perceived by other members of your research group in equally as, for example, the perception of paternity for my male colleagues. So, uh, understanding like maternity as a potential obstacle to develop your scientific career. So, you, from since on, maybe your commitment is not going to be as stronger as it was, not as strong as it, as it was. That could be uh, probably my, my the main difficulty for me, and how, how I, I dealt with this uh, difficulty. Uh, well, I, I tried to do my, my best and to work even even harder. No? That was uh, the, how to solve the, the problem. And now let's talk about mentoring. You know, in your experience different, but in my particular case, for example, I didn't have a, a mentor. 
but I recognize that it's really very useful and also if you, your, your mentor is a woman that you can be I mean, guided uh, properly you know? and of course it's something that it's really very interesting because your experience is different. Yeah, I, I'm very happy to answer this question because my mentor is a very important in my life and a very beloved person for me. Uh, when you start with Peggy in science, uh, your mentor is a very important person because he transmits the, the pressure of science and he is um, the, the person that you look at when you are learning. In my specific uh, case, my mentor uh, is still working with me, he's, he's in my team. Uh, he, I learned from him many things, and the most important ones are not just about crystallography, but it's about more important things like the, the, the way of doing science, the generosity in the science world, and the pressure of learn and transmit knowledge. But all in all, if you ask me, is this really a rewarding activity? And I would say definitely it is. It's very rewarding. It's very, I mean, I'm very grateful and very happy for having this opportunity because it's, uh, uh, when you are, uh, when you work in science, you, each day you have the opportunity to learn new things, to discover new things, um, and to interact with others because science is not a uh, individual activity, you have to interact with the rest of the members of your research group, with the rest of the scientific community, and it's really a very enriching um, work. So, of course, I, I would like to encourage you as much as possible because we need in science um, many more talented and young women to be at, at the top uh, position in, in science, in, even in decision making. And I think that women, uh, that we have a lot to, to do in, in science and in the STEM field, of course. So finally, both of us, uh, what we want our final message is that we really like to encourage you to take part in this um, marvelous adventure because we need you. Uh, we need young and talented uh, women uh, in science for today and for uh, the best of our future. So from here, from Spain, from the University of Oviedo, we would like really to encourage you as much as possible to join our field. Uh, I completely agree. We need you. Uh, we need women in science. That is a um, uh, wonderful way of being happy and make a better world. Um, bye bye. Bye. From the Museum of Geology of the University of Oviedo. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.
And those were some of the things that really excited me. But growing up, I didn't think I really had access to doing anything with that. Um, my dad uh, had been an attorney, but his father had been an engineer at NASA in Cape Canaveral during the early 60s when they were really starting to send the rockets up. So when we were going through my dad's things, we were actually finding all of these artifacts from Cape Canaveral in the 60s before it became Cape Kennedy. Um, but he would tell stories about um, when they would send a rocket up, everybody would leave class, go into the courtyard, watch the rocket launch, and go back to class afterwards. And that excitement just really dug in. Um, I always thought it was just so exciting to be able to think about how we could know all of the things that we know and all of the things that we could do with a little bit of hard work and creativity. Um, so I, that's always really been fascinating to me. Um, when I got to college, I was studying for chemistry. Um, and I knew I, I enjoyed chemistry to a certain extent because I had taken AP chemistry in high school had enjoyed parts of it, really was fascinated by the pieces of the atomic structure. That was what really spoke to me in chemistry. But um, my best friend and the guy I was dating and I would frequently find a room and the three of us would study together. And they spent a lot of time talking about um, intro physics and atomic structure. And I started listening and thinking, wait, atomic structures are in physics too? That's, that's the part of chemistry I thought was really cool. And so the next semester I took Intro to Physics instead of Chem 2, fell in love with it. Um, hadn't taken physics in high school, even though we had a really great physics teacher in my high school. We just fell in love with it. Fell in love with the idea of understanding how an atom is put together and how we could know that, and how crystalline structures are put together. And I just started following the course pattern that you take as a science major kept doing okay. I wasn't the top student in my class, but I was doing okay. And I was enjoying it. And it was challenging. And I love being challenged. I love being able to figure out puzzles. I saw that smile. <laughs> um, and so the next step was applying to graduate school. So you get to your senior year and you start thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And started applying to graduate schools, found a couple that focused at least some of their faculty on areas that I was already looking at in a senior research project, and followed that, all the while knowing that I was really interested in working with people as well as with science. Um, my senior year, I actually had a, a part-time job tutoring people in intro physics. And at first, it was just a way to look different on my grad school applications. But I fell in love with coming up with creative ways to make the ideas of physics make sense to other people, just as much as I was in love with the physics itself. And so went through graduate school, finished my degree, um, but then um, through a lot of ins and outs, actually found that there was another research field where I could actually be doing physics, but also be researching how it is that people learn physics and help them to do better at it. And one of the things that's always been important to me is making a contribution so that my corner of the world is a better place. And if I could help people understand physics a little better, that gets them one step closer to their own goals in a lot of cases, no matter what those goals are, whether it's med school, whether it's being scientifically literate so you can understand whether or not somebody's trying to sell you a bill of goods, whether it's becoming an engineer, whether it's becoming a teacher. And so my research the last more than a decade is actually focused on ways to help students learn physics better, and actually to a certain extent, what makes it, what makes the experience different for women and for minorities than it does for traditional looking physics, physicists and scientists. Um, but I also have the privilege of being able to work professionally with the programs that train our math and science teachers. Um, we have a collaborative program where we have co-directors between the sciences and education. And we're able to really give them 
good college course work both in how to teach in new and innovative and hands-on ways and also still get good science research and content understanding. And the students that we graduate are just fabulous. I can't wait for my kids to be in their classrooms because they're going to just have a blast. That's, that's a thumbnail sketch of how I've gotten more of it, where I am. Um, so I'm Morgan Viss. I'm the Chair of Environmental and Plant Biology at Ohio University. Um, and so I, I, I liked a lot of things when I was um, in K-12. Uh, I took a lot of different types of classes. My high school was one where they were preparing you to go to college. And um, once I got to college, I was lucky enough to, and you know, they were talking about mentors, I was lucky enough to actually be at a small college like such as this one. Um, and my advisor was in the admissions department. And in the end, that was a really, really good thing for me because he understood the whole university or the whole college. And so when I told him I was kind of interested in STEM, he was like, okay, we'll take chemistry, physics, and biology. And um, I had gone in with this preconceived notion that I was going to be a chem, econ, double major, and sell pharmaceuticals. <laughs> that was my thing. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, chemistry, I liked it, but I didn't like it a lot. Econ, I got through the first quarter of econ. Um, so I did have uh, biology and physics to fall back on because I had already started, uh, started those paths. And um, then the, the college I went to, you had to go to school in the summer. I was like, okay, how can I get out of going to school in the summer? <laughs> and it turns out that there was a field station not too far away um, for Michigan State University and I could take courses there and transfer them back to my college. And so I would have taken courses in the summer, but I could be outside and all that. And so I have to admit that I, um, I looked at the course, course uh, uh, listings and there was one called Phycology. And I was like, I don't know what that is. But I had a dictionary, and I literally looked the word up in the dictionary, and it's the study of algae. And I thought, okay, because um, then I get to then I get to kind of swim around in a lake in the summer. So this was like this was sounding even better. Um, but anyhow, I really fell in love with those organisms. Um, I was lucky enough to do a. Uh, undergraduate research project on the algae and the person that I did that with was at another university and so um, he invited me to stay for graduate school and I thought I want to do graduate school because I want to work in a lab but I want to be in charge so I'm kind of one of these I like to be in charge people um, so I went and did a master's did my PhD and uh, was lucky enough to, you know, do a postdoc and uh, land a job um, at a university. And I have to say, Ohio University is just the kind of place I wanted to be at because I, I, like you, I really like the teaching and I really like the research and I wanted some place where I could do both of those those things. Um, some days, some days, you know, I have. People who think I should do more research, and some days I have uh, supervisors who think I should do more teaching, but um, still, that's the way. So, so I, I, yeah, science is just a, a really fun job. So, I didn't say at the very beginning, there is a prepared set of questions we can ask. But you guys and I know have voices. <laughs> So if you have something you want to know or ask or something they say spurs something that you want to follow up on, please feel free. This was entitled a discussion, not lecture. So, but, so I'm not looking like we're ready to speak yet. <laughs> um, so what challenges, if any, have you faced 
as a woman in STEM, and then how you dealt with them. Let the GM answer first. Okay. Well, um, I, I I got the prepared questions um, beforehand and everything, and I, I thought about them, and and I must admit that. Um, Hearing what I've heard from other women in STEM, I would have to say that I have not faced uh, nearly the challenges that, that other women have, and I'm um, eternally grateful that I haven't, and I think that that has, has helped me be where I am today. Um, so, but I would say that things that have helped me get here um, are I, I have a very good network of people. I have a lot of people that I look up to as mentors. Um, and maybe not at the time did I think that they were doing a great job helping me, but um, certainly I look back and I go, oh yes, that person was a mentor to me and they were helping me um, along the way there. So I haven't, I can't really say that I've faced a lot of challenges that way. I would say that it's not common to come along things that are explicit challenges. Um, you don't see the kinds of things they did in the 1890s and even the 1930s where people would refuse to hire women because you were taking a man's job. And that would happen even in the 60s and 70s. You don't typically see things that are explicit like that. They do happen occasionally but it's not very common. But what you do see are little things that pile up and that people don't necessarily think about being challenges. Um, the example that comes to mind is both my first year in grad school and my first year as a faculty member, I was one of the only women in my department. Um, as a matter of fact, in my first faculty job, I was the only woman they'd ever hired. And this was in the late 90s. And I was the first woman faculty member in physics, ever. And so, no one would talk to me. Because they were afraid that I would think I would, they were coming on to me, or I would come on to them. And they didn't want to get in that situation. So they just avoided me. Trying to be a first year faculty member and learn the culture of your new job when nobody is willing to talk to you is a little challenging. Because there are a whole lot of how do you get things done kinds of rules that you need to have that communication to be able to figure out. Um, after a couple months, I actually managed to figure out a way to break down that wall a little bit, but it took several months to figure out how to get people to actually start talking. In grad school, it sounds silly when you think about it until you realize just how much this impacts you. Uh, I was doing research in a seven-story physics building. There were only women's bathrooms on every other floor. And they were retrofitted room closets. Not exaggerating, really, room closets. So I had to either go upstairs a floor or downstairs a floor multiple times a day to go to the restroom. But there were men's room on every floor. On every floor. And my colleagues reported that they were normal kinds of bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I never checked this out for myself. I really wasn't that curious. But yes, there were men's rooms. And actually, they had gone to a lot of trouble to retrofit those bathrooms as women's bathrooms because the building had been built with no women's rooms at all. Because it was a science building? Because it was a science building, and why would women need to go to the bathroom in the science building? Yeah. They weren't going to be there, right? right. Yeah, my undergrad. <laughs> and that sends a message to you subliminally that you're just not supposed to be here. Unless you're ornery enough to ignore that and make your own way anyway. So are they explicit go away signs or things that are really obvious? Not most of the time. but. There are little things that can really get in the way that you don't think about and that aren't really obvious to people who aren't going through them. 
And so one of the things I try to do is when I come across additional challenges like that, see what I can do to make that better for the people who come after me. Did either of you, this is what I remember experiencing in grad school, um, first seminar class, I didn't have a seminar class as an undergrad, first seminar class in grad school, one, just intimidating because everyone seemed to know, you know always feel like first year of grad school, everyone knows a whole lot more than you. But then when I would speak up, my comment would be ignored. Five minutes later, a guy would say the same thing, or a very similar thing, and suddenly that generated conversation. And that happened, you know, the first time, it happens. Always, you know, second time, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. You start to wonder. <laughs> Did you ever? I have to admit that when I was a first year graduate student, I just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was very intimidating, mm -hmm. and no one was going to make it less intimidating for you. The, a lot of the culture, at least where I was, was very much, we're going to get to better understanding of how the world, how the universe works, by arguing about it. And at least in my upbringing, it was all about making things smooth for everybody else, accommodating other people. And so the idea that all of a sudden I was supposed to be able to argue with people instead of agreeing with them and making things nice, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a personal problem. But it's not an uncommon one for a mm -hmm. lot of women. So once again, speaking up in yeah. a first year graduate seminar was not something that was very easy. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to say that I don't really experience that as much now. No, it's gotten a lot better. But the variation I do experience is the colleague of mine who likes to talk over everybody and repeat the same thing and kind of talk people into submission. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a gender issue usually, though. That's just a... <coughs> yes. Where I am, that tends to be a gender okay. issue. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. It might not be everywhere. It's very gender variety. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm curious with the communication problem you mentioned earlier that no one was talking to you. Yeah. And you said you were able to get around it. Did you have a strategy? Did you say, okay, let me try to get close to the, the, a senior male faculty member, and if he could talk to me, then the others would see that's okay? Or did it just sort of happen organically? I wish I could say that I had been smart enough to have a strategy for that. <laughs> um, it was luck. Okay. Um, I walked in one morning after going to the gym and two of the other guys on the faculty were having a cup of coffee and uh, I made an offhand, uh, slightly, slightly off-color comment and that broke the ice in a way that nothing else probably would have. Oh, she's human. Okay. She won't get mad if we talk. <laughs> Um, so, cause, and I put this question third, thinking if you had challenges and there are things that had to keep you going as to overcome them. So what do you find so rewarding? I know you've both addressed this to some degree. Figuring out some, some puzzle that I've been trying to work on, whether it's just how do I get this student who's struggling with it to understand this idea, whether it was how does this crystal structure change when it's only eight eggs from thick and it's only and it's got dangling surface bonds, so that's going to change a lot about the behaviors of the material. Both of those are really really cool challenges. Being able to come up with answers and know that that was my work. That's an awesome feeling. Knowing that I made a difference in something. Powerful experience. I guess the, the, one of the best things for me is working in the laboratory with my research group of undergraduate and graduate students. I find that very rewarding and actually last summer um, I was sitting there having coffee first thing in the morning with uh, my two graduate students and we were talking about something and I was like 
yeah, this is why I, I do mm -hmm. what I do. I'm, I'm really happy to help those, those students out. And it made me actually, I, I've been the chair of my department for five years and, and I was coming to the end of my term and I had to make a decision whether or not to continue to be chair or to let someone else be chair for a while. Um, I'll probably go back to it, but when I had that experience, there was that epiphany that, you know, this is why I do what I do. So yes, I'm going to continue to be a faculty member and, and work with those students. Um, I, I also teach a, a large non-majors class, um, freshman level class, and I really enjoy that because I get to um, uh, hopefully uh, make the public more aware of science and why science is important to us. And since I'm a plant biologist, it tends to be economic botany types of things um, that we talk about. But I was, I was so um, absolutely thrilled uh, uh, earlier this semester, I was uh, with my son before his hockey practice at the local um, Larry's Dog House local hot dog place and this man comes up to me and he says you're you're Dr. Viss uh, Shia and I said yeah I'm, I'm Dr. Viss and he said I took your class 16 years ago <laughs> and it was great and I remember everything about the botany and I was just like yes <laughs> and my son was like oh yeah whatever <laughs> but, but it made me feel very good. So, so there are always kind of really cool, rewarding things about your job. I have to echo that. This week, I was helping my daughter carry a project into her classroom. They were actually learning about plant cells, and she had to create a model of a plant cell. So, she had extra stuff to carry, and I was helping her carry some of it. And we normally just drop her off at the front door. Um, but I have gone to her school at least once a year on career day um, and this year they haven't had career day yet but the middle school has a girls in engineering math and science club and they were sponsoring a event for the fifth grade only um, the fifth grade actually has a theme throughout their curriculum this year on education and equity um, so they were bringing in women scientists and engineers from the community to talk a little bit about what they do in their work and they asked me to come in so i came in and i brought an electromagnetism demonstration and when I was walking my daughter into her classroom, a group of the fifth grade boys walked by and went, I remember you. You did smoke bubbles three years ago and you did the magnet thingy. Hey, science lady, I'm gonna come get science lady. <laughs> I was like, you have just made my week. I am now science lady. <laughs> but being able to make that kind of an impact where you remember four or five years later, because you came in and did something that actually made them think and inspired them to do something. That's worth everything. Yeah, well, what do you think like, are the challenges, and maybe even rewards, of like, trying to be a mother and pursuing a STEM career? Because I feel like it could be hard like, looking, like, because I'm getting ready to start grad school, and I feel like from like, looking here on, that seems like unmanageable. <laughs> that seems um, impossible. You both heard us referring to our kids, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is manageable. I won't say it's easy, but science isn't easy, right? Um, but one of the things I actually tell my daughter is the things that are worth doing are usually hard. Um, and I can't say that the strategies that I use now are the ones that I used when my kids were babies. They're not but my kids need different things now than they did when they were babies. When they were babies, they needed somebody to pick them up and feed them and change them and just love them. And you can do that any time of day or night they need it. Now that they're older, they need specific things at different times of day and they need somebody to talk to them and help them think about what's going on in the world. And so that's a very different thing. But it also means that next week when my daughter's on spring break, she's gonna go to my science classes with me she's actually going to participate in the activity we're doing in class on Monday, which she actually helped me put some of the equipment together for. And then Tuesday, she's going to just 
bring in a book and some headphones and sit while I teach my, my Tuesday classes. It's not quite at her level, but math is a little beyond where a fifth grader can go. <laughs> but there are things that I do to involve my kids in my work sometimes. The, but when I get home for dinner, that time is theirs. And they know it. And then when they go to bed, up until about a couple of years ago, I would pick up my work when the kids went to bed. My kids are old enough that that no longer works. <laughs> it used to work really well. It doesn't work anymore. But most of the moms I know, and actually more and more of the dads that I know, are just finding ways that once they have kids, they just think more strategically about how they organize their work lives. Um, when we put our course schedules together, we actually pay attention to, okay, Andy's got three kids and his wife is working, so he needs to make sure that he's not doing too many classes outside of these hours. His, one of the kids is not school age and special needs. My kids are a little bit older, so I can stretch into this time frame, but my husband works strict eight to five. So if I'm not there, we need to have somebody else in place. My other coworker has a daughter who's a couple years older, so she can take the bus to the university if her mom's not available to pick her up. So we all have different things that we do to accommodate those kind of scheduling constraints. But having coworkers who are willing to listen and help you think through the best way to strategize what you need and what your kids need, it's doable. It just takes some creativity. Yeah, I would I would echo that. I mean, there are there are people um, that I know who are somewhat, shall I say, intolerant of you having a child. Um, but those those are slowly becoming fewer and mm -hmm. far between. Um, with that, uh, so you know, it, it is a it is a strategy, and I guess I've always, I, some people. Some people do it one way, other people do it another way, and it's you know whatever you want to do. Some people have like their home life, and they have their work life, mm -hmm. and mine have always intermeshed. Um, I'm a field biologist, so I go away on on um, uh, field trips and things like that, and my family has come on sabbatical with me, and so we've we've kind of just made those work. And as she says, at, at different times in your life it's going to be um, different ways that you have to have to change your your workload um, and usually I, I think it is getting as I say it's getting better in science um, and in a university setting in general um, more of my uh, colleagues who are male are taking more of the responsibility for for their children so yeah. So there is more of that, like previously, none of the men in my department would care when they taught because, you know, their, their spouse is going to take care of their child. But, but more and more people are talking about how to fit that, mm -hmm. how to fit that into their, into their life. And I got some really good, you know, when, when I was thinking about this whole mentoring thing, so I'm a big tennis player. and. Uh, I try to play once a week, and and uh, back in the day when I first had my child, uh, I played uh, with a bunch of women who were probably about 10 to 15 years older than me. And one of the best things that they told me is, you don't have to be super mom. You know, just because you had a kid doesn't mean your house has to be like super clean. Um, that you have to make all the meals, that all this sort of stuff. And and they told me take time for myself. And that was some of the best advice that, that I got there because I did think that I had to be, in, in my day it was Martha Stewart. I thought, you know, all of a sudden, oh, I have a kid, so now I have to be like this yeah. Your life does super not have to be person. a perfect Instagram page. No. So, so that, was, that was so helpful to me when I decided to have a child. Uh, I have to admit that I've been on some women in science panels. Um, and I was on a panel with uh, four other women, and four of us, we all had a one. And and I do want to emphasize that you don't just you don't just have to have one. 
you can have you know the fam the size of family that that you want to have um, because I did have a graduate student um, ask me you know she said I look around and I see all the women who have a kid who are professors they have one and she's like I want to have three and I said that's fine that's wonderful you do that I'm an only child and I have an only child but you know that that is that's a you're stuck with just getting one if you want it. Yeah. I think just of the three physicists in my department, Z has one, I have two, Andy has three. Andy's wife works full time as well. Um, actually, Z's wife works full time. So all three of us are dual career couples. Um, looking broader in my department, actually, most of the women I know have two or three kids. I live one. So it's just a matter of figuring out what you need and what your family needs, and then figuring out how to be creative to make it happen. And there's no one right answer. <laughs> Would you say, like, because of your schooling or education, that you like put it off for a later time? Because a lot of people like say that, oh, you need to have kids until after you finish school. Or that was very much the advice that I was given in graduate school, and I followed it. Um, that is not the advice that I have given the new faculty that have joined the department in the last few years. And in grad school, I had friends who had children in grad school. Now, mind you, having kids in grad school was really challenging for my friends. Um, but their professors, I have to give them credit, said, you make us figure out how to do it. And there's where you also need to have a supportive department yes. and stuff. so the in the good mentor and everything I would say this same sort of thing so I um, I had the post tenure baby uh, and I don't recommend um, waiting and I've heard this from a number of people just say you know there's never a great time to have a kid yeah and there's always a great time to have a kid so you know when when you're ready to have your family, that's that's when when you should should try to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, don't let other people tell you how to do it. It's always going to be challenging because being a parent is challenging, especially in today's world. But if you're going to grad school, you know. I, um, I guess I, I would say that in grad school, your um, your relationship with your advisor is really, really important. So choose wisely, and if you don't choose wisely, go somewhere else. Um, there's there's no you know you can you can move you can mm -hmm. do that. The other thing I would say, and it never occurred to me, like my parents were always like, oh. You finished undergrad, go to grad school, you know, get your master's, get your PhD, you know, do it all now and stuff. So I've had a number of graduate students in my lab who have come back to school. They know exactly what they want. Um, so don't think just because you're not going to grad school right after undergrad that grad school is not available to you. Um, you know, there, there are good reasons for taking some time off. Um, and there it's, it's great to come back to. So I've, I've seen students be successful, you know, both ways, coming, you know, being 22 and just finishing and being 32 and deciding that they wanted something different. I, I remember Emily being in there with oh, her, and <laughs> her, her son. But but making it work all the same, I guess. Yeah, I had a I had a single mother who had a child who was a year older than me. Uh, or sorry, a year older than me, a year older than my child in in the in the lab, and uh, um, she she worked out, she worked hard. She 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 had a network. She had to have this network to make that all work with a. Uh, um, uh, he was in like second or third grade. She was there, but she did. I want to revisit the point that you were making. 
have knowing which graduate mentor to work for is really key. So one of the things you want to do is actually talk to your students. Find out what it's like to live a week in the life of that lab and see if that's going to be compatible with how you work well and if that's something that you want to learn. Because it's not just the research they're doing, it's also the work environment that you're going to be in. And there are work environments that are amazing and allow you to really learn and grow. And there are work environments that don't work well. And that's true no matter what kind of job you do. Whether you get a job, whether you go to grad school, you know, graduate school, they let you talk to the other students and find out what it's like. Use that. Students will tell you what it's like to work for Dr. Jones or Dr. Smith. It's also true for <coughs> professional schools, since I know some of you are interested in med school mm -hmm. stuff. All med schools aren't created the same. Yeah. So this is where a campus tour and talking to, or if you, and even if you are just doing it on your interview day, if you get the interview, talking to the other med students in terms of, and asking them these questions is important because different med schools have different philosophies on how they interact with students and things like this. And some of them are much more personable and some of them are much more regimented, although I think the regimented is slowly dissipating. But yeah. But talk to them too and don't just ask questions about what what are your responsibilities, but pay attention to the subtle subtle things like whether or not somebody's really stressed out all the time. Whether or not they're happy in their work. These are things that you can if you're looking for it, pick up on that you might not really want to ask explicitly, but that you can figure out mm, that might not be a, a good place to spend four or five years of my life. But I think that goes to, too, you have to know yourself, yes. and you have to be very reflective of yourself and say, you know, what what is going to work for me? So, you know, am I comfortable with a hands-off advisor, somebody who just lets me kind of go off in my one direction, or do I need somebody that I'm going to want to meet with once a week in the beginning so that I, you know, and, and even with a hands-on advisor, you still, you know, you have to take personal responsibility for, for what you're doing and, and bring it to that person and lay it out and say, I've gotten here, I'm kind of stuck. I have these three options of where I think I want to go. I mean, we love it when they bring the options, you know, <laughs> what what's going on and stuff. But but you really do have to, you know, kind of know what your what you want and and how you work best and what sort of things are. I don't know. I had I had an advisor who made me cry. You know, and I thought to myself, well, <laughs> need to rethink this. Um, so. And give yourself permission to rethink if you need to. So your hand up. Yeah, um, during like the course of graduate school, I was in the school of the region, and it's like a thing that was really thought, like, if you're going to go on the field, this was what you wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a woman or man. Yeah. That's not a gender thing. That's <laughs> everybody. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that's when it's time to take a couple of days off and go do something that you love that's not your research. And then come back to it with a fresh start. And it's a time to let yourself rethink things a little bit and figure out, okay, is this something I can work around? Is it something I can solve? Or do I need to come at this from a different point of view? And sometimes that's a research question. I just need to do this experiment rather than this one. And sometimes it's, my advisor has made me cry one too many times. I need to find a different advisor. Yeah, I, I think everybody has a bit of an existential crisis during their graduate career. Um, but but you do need to find a way to get through it, and then, and I think you know sometimes getting through it means like this wasn't this wasn't a good choice of mine. I'm going to do something else. Um, 
but you do need to give yourself a little bit of time to think that through. Like I'm a I'm a kind of snap person, and so I know now. Boy, I wish I knew that. Um, <laughs> I know now. Like okay, I'm I'm really upset about this right now. I'm gonna go away. Think about things and then come back to it. We do this all the time as faculty because we submit um, journal articles and this uh, or grant proposals, mm -hmm. and you get the reviews back. You have to grow this this pretty good skin, um, and and I still have lots of holes in my skin, so things get through. But I'm I'm trying not to. But I will read like the. Um, the reviews of, of a paper that I submitted, I will read those, <sighs> take a big breath, I will set it aside, you know, I will do my other stuff and maybe four days later I'll come back and say, okay, yeah, I think they were right about this, I can now be objective and, and think about doing it. And so whatever helps you kind of be more objective about your career and your life and the things that you're doing in graduate school, the better off you'll be. Honestly, I can't imagine that there would be any life where there weren't a point where you felt that you were at a breaking point, even if you didn't go into the science, sciences, even if you didn't go into graduate school. There are going to be points in almost everybody's life that are just hard and that make you feel like you're at that breaking point. And the difference between the people who stay and the people who don't people who stay felt like they had a reason to persist. And frequently that reason to persist is because there's something in it that you value. It's like you have to step back and ask, give yourself permission to say, okay, that was a bad review. I'm not going to look at it for a couple days and then I'll see what's useful in it. Or that was something that was hard to hear. But then you say, okay, this is what I value, this is what I'm going to do, here's how we move forward. And sometimes that means rethinking and going in a different direction, and sometimes it just means plowing through it. But you find your own strategies for making it work. And talk to your peers about what strategies they use. Yes. Your network of people. Yes. Don't let yourself be isolated. That is the hardest work environment to be in, even more than an environment that's negative. Being isolated is so difficult because you don't know how to work through those, those parts where you feel like you're going to break. If you've got that network, you can walk mm -hmm. down the hall and say, hey, I'm really having a tough time with this. Do you have any advice on how to handle mm -hmm. this? And that might be where the subtle discrimination can come in, in terms of, as you already said, one, one so of the places. One yes. of the places. So I think sometimes as a woman, the subtle things can lead to that breaking point that would be different in a woman than in a man. That I think everyone will hit that breaking point. Yes. It's it's pretty rare for somebody to look at you and say, "Well, you've you're clearly pregnant now. You should quit your job when you've had your baby." Mm -hmm. It's pretty rare. It actually happened to me ten years ago, but it's very rare. My colleagues were horrified when they heard about that. Thankfully. That person was interviewing to work with us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't get the job. No. <laughs> this, this isn't my area at all. I'm over in the humanities. But um, one, of, one of the charts that they had up had me thinking, and you're, you said you mentioned you've been chair of your department. Um, are we seeing the trend reverse so that we have more, uh, you know, chairs of science departments who are women, um, the, the leaders of the, the biggest research group, um, women, or you know, the the, the the way that number just declines in Spain was pretty shocking. It depends on the science. Okay, but, it depends but on the discipline. It yeah. it is it. That is not unusual no. that those types of numbers to see those in the in the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that is just cohorts by age, mm -hmm. but some of it is people reaching the breaking point and deciding their values are going to leave them someplace else. 
there's less of that now, but there's still some of that. Yeah, if you look at the numbers and then disciplines, biology is much more equal. Mm -hmm. um, and undergraduate, you actually see more women graduating with a degree in biology than you see men on average. But when you start going into grad school, it's still going up the food chain sort of in, in the career. But part of that is age. Some of that is age, you know, because it takes a long time to become a full professor. So mm -hmm. it's going to be slower change and then in the physics physics and engineering and engineering computer science. computer science it's still a math it's still much math more. less than the others no. is it okay I've yeah those numbers in a while math covers around the 30 percent mark physics and computer science and electrical engineering especially cover around 20. yeah, yeah. well in in my own department it's smaller um, uh one of the one of the slogans we used to have is doing botany since 1812, mm -hmm. um, which our, our university was founded in 1804. Everything says 1804 on it. Um, but uh, I, I was the first woman to make professor in my department. So, so it, it seems like all that stuff should have been done in the 60s. <laughs> and certainly not the 60s then maybe the 80s or yeah. something but you know so you still find things where it, it seems kind of silly to to be like like the first at something like that I was the first um, female grad student for my master's advisor which I didn't know when I started it came out maybe a year or two in because he was like you know all concerned like if he had to treat me any different than what I doing okay and I just sort of looked at it and I'm like, no. Where I'm as frustrated with you as the guys, it's okay. <laughs> well, and I, I think though, I think there are a lot more people out there these days paying attention to um, uh, to these issues and stuff. And so I have to say that I have taken some strategies with uh, young women in our department, like. Um, we have these very prestigious uh, internal uh, graduate student grants. And I make sure that I mention to um, the female graduate students and the male graduate students, but the female graduate students in particular, I, you know, I, I tell them, you didn't get it this year, but you should look at those reviews and apply next year for it. Because one of the things is that women don't tend to um, continually apply for like grants is a is a good example like they they did it once and it didn't get funded so they aren't going to necessarily think to revise it and submit it again um, whereas men tend to think oh okay they want that oh, I'll just put that in and 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 put the grant back in so I, I really try hard to think of things that you know, I hope will make small things, <laughs> large things I'd love to, but um, small things that make a difference with, uh, with the younger women in our, in our department. And that echoes something that we see, at least in our physics classes, and these are broad generalizations, but you tend with female students, if they get a bad test grade in physics, say, oh, I must not be good at this. The a, a male student with the same background, the same grades going into that class, it's the same test grade, and they don't say, it's my fault, they say, the teacher's a bad teacher. <laughs> oh, that teacher's lousy, I'm, I'm a great physics student, it's their fault, this is a bad grade. And when you come at it from those two different perspectives, how you proceed is different afterwards. If it's just that person's a lousy professor and I'm good at this, you keep going. And you complain about the lousy professor. If you think you're bad at something, or if you think, conversely, that you got a good grade this time, oh, that's just lucky. I got that because I'm lucky and I worked really hard. It's a different mindset that's approaching the class, and it makes it harder to persist when you hit those roadblocks. And so one of the things you can do to cultivate success is to try and get out of your own way. 
and recognize that you are good enough to do this and you're good enough to try again when you don't succeed the first time. And that's a, I don't recognize that's a hard thing to do, but recognizing your own abilities and your own strengths and telling you, finding people, if you can't do it for yourself, finding a network of people to cheer you on, whether it's your professor or whether it's just the people in your family, in your peer group that you study with, to cheer you on and say, yeah, you need to try that again. You did great, you can do even better next time. And hearing that message pushing you on gets you through some of those breaking points. There's a recent study said, who did also? <laughs> Which I actually did in grad school, and not, not, <laughs> not deliberately. Cats, everyone knows I have cats. <laughs> Someone gave oh. me a cat toy that was a vet. Mm -hmm. You also had the white lab coat. So after a particularly horrible day in the lab, over some drinks with other grad students, that lab coat got labeled with the professor's name and then dangled in front of the cat to mall. <laughs> I felt much better. <laughs> we actually bought a pinata for my son for him to beat up and then set on fire after particularly bad incident recently. <laughs> so, you know, there's different coping mechanisms. Yeah. And some of them are easier than others, but <laughs> you need to find the ones that are going to work for you, or at least make you smile a little bit when you're having a rough day. Well, it's interesting to me that, you know, uh, I guess the nails in the upper position or uh, maybe, is there more, in general, is there more males in the, uh, so in the graduate in STEM field than females just in general? If you lump them all together? Yeah. Yes. Okay. If you look at it discipline by discipline, some of them are doing way better than others. It's just, it's interesting to me because, and Dr. Sawyer can attest to this, I've had her for probably five classes now. <laughs> And, you know, at least in my perspective, it seems like, you know, the girls are just usually the harder working students than the males. You know, in anatomy and physiology, I'm <laughs> dissecting, or not dissecting, I'm skinning the mink when I should be looking for a certain organ. The girls are working hard and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and stuff. And me and another guy are getting all this stuff. And it, it just seems to me that, you know, uh, it's just interesting. That, so why do you think that it seems like I don't know, that they're harder working. And I don't know if that's a fair statement or not. But um, <laughs> you've actually hit on something that I've been doing as a, a research project with a couple of my students over the past several years. We actually have been looking at, at least within my university, the factors that encourage people to either stay in STEM majors or, or leave. Um, back in the late 80s, there was actually a study done, but it was done at big research universities, not smaller schools. It's 25 years old, so we've changed a lot, hopefully, since then. So I thought, okay, it's time to actually try this out. So we interviewed some of our students one-on-one, -on -one, either that had stayed in STEM majors and were close to graduation, or who we knew had switched out of STEM majors. And based on that, we actually created some surveys and gathered a lot more data so we could actually do something statistical so that we weren't just looking at anecdotes. And there were a couple things that really stood out. Um, one was that the people who stayed in STEM majors really enjoyed the challenge, really wanted to figure out the puzzle, no matter what kind of puzzle it was, but really, really found something fascinating about the content area they were studying in, whether it's marine biology, whether it's physics, whether it's astronomy, any of it. And there were a, a very small group who left because they weren't being challenged enough, which made some of my coworkers really excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of the ones who were leaving, especially among the women students and especially among the minority students, they were just as bright. They were getting grades that were just as good. But they said, mm -hmm. no. There is something in this particular climate that I don't have to put up with because I'm smart and I'm talented and I can take these talents and do something else. And I can take
take these talents and do something else where I will be treated the way I want to be treated. And so a lot of those folks actually left not because they couldn't do the work, but because they wanted to go someplace to do different work where they would be appreciated and get to work in a setting that they found value in. We're going to call back into the hiring process. You said you were hired in the first female to be hired in the department. When you're looking at parts that are primarily male, it's more difficult for women to break in because you have a bunch of guys yeah. thinking about it, and they and they have that mentality. And because it is over dominated um, by white guys, <laughs> then it's going to be harder for them to be accepting of of the students, even though they're working harder. But it's easier once you get that first one in. Get somebody else in who's not a white guy. Then it's easier to bring in other people with more and add more diversity. So, Little by little. <laughs> little by well. But it, it also it also can be difficult because um, you can end up overburdening yes. uh, either the the either women or um, minorities, but with um, having to do more service work and, and the like there. Uh, uh, I remember talking to a Latina, and she's like, yeah, I get asked to be on every committee on the, mm -hmm. at the university because they get a twofer, mm -hmm. right? She's woman, she's a woman and a minority in the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my department, for a long time, there were two women in the department, and literally at a faculty meeting, they'd be like, okay, we have to have this committee, and I would look at her and go, is it your turn or my turn? And she'd be like, could you take this one? And I'm like, okay, I'll take this one. Uh, so so that sort of stuff, you have to be really careful about that as, mm -hmm. as a chair of a department um, as well, that you don't overburden people with service and then they don't get the opportunity to do the other parts of their job. So that can be, and, and that can drive people away to mm -hmm. some, some degree as yeah. well. Sometimes voluntarily and sometimes not. Yeah. Because the service work isn't always valued. Um, do you feel like you have to go like above and beyond because you were a female to like to be in the same plane as other colleagues? Like, like you had to be in that extra, that extra amount just for them to see you as a I always had that feeling, but that was because I skipped a grade, and so I already had that imposter syndrome going on from a very early age. So I can't say it's because I was a woman in science, because I was doing that before I knew I was going to be a scientist. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that I ever made sure that I felt that way, but I, I have to admit that I was, I was a second woman hired in my department. There, there was already a, a woman in the department and I definitely got the distinct impression that a couple of my colleagues felt like the reason that they hired me was not because I was a good scientist but because I was a woman and I did end up just taking the attitude that they got damn lucky. Um, because if, if that was the reason that they voted to hire me in then, then they just got this huge bonus of, you know, I'm a, I'm a really good scientist too. So I, I kind of just had to like not think that way and, mm -hmm. and just say, well, uh, if they did, it's not my fault if they voted for me because I was a woman. But, but you don't like to be known as the diversity hire. And some people really try to make you feel that way sometimes, whether you are or not. And so you have to find ways to realize that some of those people are just not going to be convinced no matter what, and to work on being the best scientist, the best researcher, the best teacher, wherever your path takes you, that you're going to be, and not let that get in your way. To use my kids' phrase, haters are going to hate. <laughs> <laughs> and those folks may or may not be convinced by anything you do, no matter how amazing you are. So you can let that get in your way and poison your work environment, but you can focus on 
being as amazing as you are. But there again, your network of yes. people <laughs> helping you say the haters are the haters yes. and you're awesome is really very helpful. And it is okay to go out and burn the lab coat with your with your network every once in a while. Every it's once just in a, a not every day. No. no. If you're doing it every day, it's probably time to find a different research group to work for. <laughs> yes. But having that kind of venting session is perfectly appropriate. Very important. All right, I don't know what word it is, but do you, like, so I'll just tell you. It's like, I interviewed somewhere, and first they said, well, you're a woman, and you're from West Virginia, and so that makes you, you know, that makes you qualified. That's my goal, is to get more women. And I'm all for that. Like, I want, like, equality of women, and I'm all for that. But then, it was more about, like, I was a woman. And then, second, your application looked nice. You seemed very qualified, and that kind of offended me. First I'm a woman, first I'm from this area, but lastly are my accomplishments that I've worked very hard for. Yeah. Like, how, what would your advice be to, like, you know, just get over that? Cause that's, <laughs> I guess, I don't know, what's your advice for that? Well, first of all, you have a list of accomplishments. Yeah. So you can focus on that and help people in that environment or anywhere else focus on those. Because you do have a lot of talent that you're bringing to the table. And if you're interviewing at grad schools or med schools or other professional schools, you're going there to increase that list of accomplishments. So being able to get them to say, yeah, I've done this. How can you get me further? Is probably something that might be productive. Do you have any other suggestions? No, no. So for, for me, I have to admit, um, years ago, uh, you know, my first name's Morgan, um, and that is equally a male and a female name, and, stuff. and so people would see me on paper and think I was a dude, <laughs> um, and be very surprised when they called me on the phone and they're like, oh no, we want to talk to Morgan. Um, you are. Uh, so, so, but, but I think, you know, if you do find yourself in that kind of situation, you, you really do want to sort of educate them about your mm -hmm. accomplishments. And then you want to think very carefully about, can you educate that, or you know, did they inadvertently say something like that, or they didn't mean it, or, yeah. were they you know, were, or, they or is it going to be one of those things where maybe, maybe I should not do go in this in this direction mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something you have to kind of decide but I've had lots of people and and I've done it myself and I worry about it now even more because because I am a chair of a department and I don't want to say something that will um, uh, turn off a, a, a younger person from from pursuing something but sometimes we all say stupid stuff uh, I had when I was in the beginning of my career, um, I I had brought in donuts, and I went to a senior colleague, and he said, "Oh, you baked. That's why we hired you." And he realized right there and then, like the look on the poor man's face. And I could I could easily forgive him him that, you know. It it just so he realized, like you know, you could see him clawing those words back. <laughs> So, so you know, so you, you kind of got to decide it, what situation it is for you. I was chuckling during that story because I actually had a similar experience. My name is Kim Shaw, um, and for a good two years of my graduate school, I was collaborating with someone on the opposite coast. And so we were emailing back and forth, and I would always sign my emails, Kim Shaw. And so we finally had an opportunity to meet face to face to talk about the project at a conference we were both attending. And he walked up and said, Oh, you're Kim. I was expecting a Korean male. <laughs> <laughs> Signing everything Kimberly ever since. <laughs> But 
But there are those little things where it can either be a moment where you educate somebody and they realize that they did something silly, or it can be a moment where you say, hmm, maybe they're, they're not quite up to my standards and they're not going to be able to take me where I need to go. And I think it's really nice like, to encourage more women to get more involved with STEM and to kind of like go the extra mile. But sometimes some, it can seem like that's so emphasized that you as an individual or your accomplishments can be kind of like put on the back burner to like your gender. Yeah. And to be honest, the way I have thought about this for a long time is that this country and frankly the planet needs all of the talented minds that we've got to be able to solve the problems that we've got, to be able to drive technology forward, to be able to solve the different things, whether it's finding cures for cancer, figuring out better ways to treat diabetes, figuring out how to have good drinking water, both in our cities and in places where climate is making that less and less accessible. There are a lot of things that we can be doing. We need all hands on deck. And if we're driving people out because we're treating people badly, we need to fix that. If people are leaving because we're not doing the best job we can educating them, or because we're giving them lousy work environments, I'm going to use forms like these to try and make that a little bit better. So yeah, it can be used to try and make a, a dog and pony show, but it can be used to make a difference. Yeah, I would just say one of the one of the questions was, you know, how do you think the public perceives scientists and women in science and the like there? And and I think it was on the video here, they were talking about working in a team and working collaboratively mm -hmm. and stuff. I don't think the public sees scientists that way so much. They see them as like a single person, usually male, in, in, uh, in a laboratory doing their own thing and not wanting to, to interact with the rest of the world, which is, is completely not the way my science is done. Now, I might not look like I'm being collaborative because I'm collaborating with my colleague in Brazil, you know, and he's not right there, but this is a great time um, to be alive in terms of being able to connect with people all over the world and the the thing that team you know working as a team has taught me is everybody brings a different perspective and that's why we're talking about like you need to have everybody all hands on deck because because like I can't tell you how many times one of the students in my lab says well why don't we do it this way and I'm like dang yeah, that's what, the, you know, that, that was the answer, and I was never going to get there. You know, I was, I was there with my blinders on, but, you know, the minute you get, like, new people into the team, um, you, you have a, a much bigger pot of ideas. Well, and you've also got a bigger pot of experiences to bring solutions to the table. It may be that you've got experiences in your own childhood, in your own education, that weren't available to me. And so something that I would never have seen is one of the first ideas that comes out of your head. And that's just as true comparing people in cities to rural backgrounds, rich cities to poor cities, as it is from one country to another. And so bringing people in from any background is valuable. And if we're losing any of that talent, that's a waste of human potential. Um, so, but yeah, so, so we've talked a little bit about perception, um, but do you still think there are major issues with perception of women in science that impacts? Nothing, once again, nothing explicit, Yeah. Um, but every, about every two years or so, somebody, for example, will do another study on course evaluations, male faculty versus female faculty. 
and they're laughing because they read the same papers as I do. Well, and, and it's very hard because student evaluations do, and those, if you teach, those matter in how you're evaluated as a faculty member. Um, but when you get into the guts of it, um, there was one study that was actually really revealing. They had a male faculty member and a female faculty member teach the exact same course in an online setting. So there was no no face-to-face -face time. Same kinds of interactions, and they each taught two sections, one as a male avatar and one as a female avatar. So they would present themselves as Mark in one and as Jane in the other. And they taught all four of these sections identically. And the two sections where the faculty member was identified as male, whether they were or not, the instructor was brilliant, he was helpful, he was friendly, all good things. And the two that were female, she was shrill, she was mean, she was all of the negative versions of those same, she was condescending, she was bright but inaccessible. And so as a a female scientist and as a female faculty member, you kind of walk a very fine line sometimes between behaving according to what society expects a woman to be, kind, nurturing, helpful, and what we expect a scientist to be, which is not necessarily kind, nurturing, or helpful. <laughs> so you can be kind, nurturing, and helpful, but then maybe you don't know your science as well. Or you can be really bright, but maybe not be very good at teaching. And it's very difficult to find that happy space in the middle because of those ways we view how men and how women interact. And it's not something that we do intentionally. It's not like people go into classes saying, oh, I've got that female prop. I'm going to give her a lower rating because she's a female and she shouldn't be teaching. It's much more subtle than that. And so I don't necessarily think there's a lot of explicit problem, but there are those little things that are different in how we expect people to act that we still work on. Well, and just to, to mention that is, you know, you, again, you need to go back to yourself too, because mm -hmm. we all have biases. Yeah. Every single one of us has biases, and we need to, you need to recognize your own biases and um, a lot of times deal with them. Um, and so for me, for example, uh, we have gone through, the past couple of years, we've gone through a lot of searches and hiring and I'm reading these, these letters and I'm going, oh, I don't like this. Oh, wait a second, that has nothing to do with that person's credentials, you know, just because that letter of recommendation said that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I have done in, um, in my research course, we do do a couple of um, implicit biases uh, tasks, online tasks, and, and the students just have to email me and say that they did it. Uh, but I think it, it's so helpful when you do exercises that help you reflect on your own biases. Uh, and, and in society, we all have them. No one is is not biased. And just to say on the nurturing thing and stuff too, I, I'm just laughing because Dr. Keene's advisor in graduate school is, is an awesome person. And I used to do a lot of team teaching with him and going on study abroad trips. And everybody was expecting me to be the nurturing one. And it's like, he's the nurturing one. I'm the one that's going to be there going like this. And, and, and it was just, it, it got difficult at times because they just always thought our two gender roles were supposed to be two things that are opposite of our personalities.